If you come to the Buddhist teachings through books or courses in school, you usually start out right with the Four Noble Truths. But often when the Buddha himself was teaching, he wouldn't start out there. He'd give first what he called a graduated discourse or a step-by-step -step discourse to get people ready to accept the Four Noble Truths. In the beginning, he'd talk about generosity and virtue, and the rewards that they bring both in this life and in life after death. But then you talk about the drawbacks of sensuality. In other words, a lot of the rewards that come from virtue and generosity have to do with sensuality. But then you say, well, they have their limitations, they have their drawbacks. And then you teach renunciation. as a safer alternative. And if you got you to think that renunciation might be a good thing, then he would teach you the Four Noble Truths. Notice that in building up to that, though, he first talks about the advantages of good practice, and then he talks about the limitations of practice that doesn't go all the way. And you see this throughout his teachings. He'll talk about the positive aspects of good behavior and the negative aspects of bad. He said that he would choose which one to, to emphasize based on the audience, based on the person he was, or people he was talking to. Some people he said were like horses who responded well to gentle treatment. He teach them about the positive aspects of skillful behavior. If you taught them about the negative aspects, they would get skittish and scared. Then there was those who wouldn't respond to the positive side, but would respond more out of a fear of the negative side. If you do things that are unskillful, this is what's going to happen. Those are like horses who would respond only to harsh treatment. Then there were the horses who responded to a mixture of the two. And then there were the horses that didn't respond to either. Those he said he would kill. In other words, he wouldn't teach them. So you have to look at yourself. What kind of teachings do you respond to? Give yourself a Dharma talk in that direction. Remembering, though, that those horses that respond to the negative side, they come in different grades. There's the horse that all you have to do is say the word whip and the horse behaves. Other horses, you have to show the whip, and it behaves. Others, you have to touch it against their, their hide, and they behave. And others has to go a little bit into the flesh before they behave, and others has to go down to the bone. Now, this is a matter of choice. You have to decide what kind of horse you're going to be, how much suffering you're going to have to face before you really get serious about the practice. One of the problems we have here in the West is that we hear so much about equanimity and patience and acceptance, and we end up being like that worst horse who has to wait until things get really bad before we respond. Otherwise, we think everything is fine, everything's going along well. I have to learn how to be accepting of whatever comes up and you get a little bit of concentration, a little bit of virtue, a little bit of generosity, and things are not so bad. But you have to remember, there are potential problems lying in wait. One of them is that the peace that comes from equanimity is not all that lasting. We hear so much on equanimity, and it's not just here in the West. When Westerners go to Thailand, that's what they hear a lot of, because the Johns over there realize that Westerners in general tend to be lacking in equanimity and patience. And so they have to emphasize that. But the problem is that some people think you stop there. The reason the Ajans emphasize equanimity and patience is only if you are patient and equanimous can you see things clearly. Can you observe your mind and be willing to admit the things in your mind that you don't ordinarily like to show to yourself or admit to yourself. Like that teaching that the Buddha gave Rahula before he taught him breath meditation, 
which is a very proactive kind of meditation. First he said you've got to make your mind like earth. In other words, make it non-reactive. Not with the idea of stopping there, but with the idea that a non-reactive mind sees things a lot more clearly. And then from there you can know what to do properly. But the temptation is once you get into that non-reactive state, it will just stay there. But it can get thrown off balance very easily. I've talked in the past about some of the John Fuhring students who had cancer, other serious diseases, and they were able to use their meditation, and it saw them all the way through to the end of their lives. There were others, though, who began to lose it as, as their, the body began to deteriorate. They just couldn't hold it together. They suffered quite a lot. In the one case in particular, the whole family were people who meditated, and the, the mother died first. And everybody was really shocked by how poorly she handled her death. She'd been meditating for quite a long time. Which shows that if you don't have the discernment along with your concentration, it's not safe. So you may hear about that and decide, well, that was her, and it's not going to be me. But you never know. I mean, you, nobody's body tells you ahead of time, this is going to be the disease you're going to have, and these are the faculties you're going to have as you go. Only if you have a noble attainment are you really safe. As the Buddha said, there are four reasons for fearing death. One is you know you've done unskillful things. There's a possibility of the consequences of those unskillful things coming back to you after you die. Others, in other cases, you're afraid of losing the body, you're afraid of losing sensual pleasures. And then the fourth one is that you haven't really seen the Dharma. It's still a matter of faith or a matter of conjecture. It's only when you've had a direct experience of it that you have no reason to fear death. So if you're the type of horse that has to wait until the whip goes into the bone. Maybe you want to change your priorities. Say, wait a minute, all I have to do is hear the word whip and I'll practice. You save yourself a lot of suffering. So don't let your equanimity get in the way. Don't think that okay is good enough. And John Mahabhu makes a comparison with different people who practice, and he says, the ones who are best at the practice are the ones who like, are like people in the world who become millionaires. They decide, as long as I'm going to be making money, might as well make a lot of money, do it well, do it in, in a virtuous and wise way. But set yourself up so that you're secure. In the same way, it's those who see that there is danger in samsara, and they don't have to experience the worst of it, they're able to pick themselves up, unlike the people in AA who have to wait until they hit rock bottom before they're ready to overcome their alcoholism. You want to be the sort of person who hears about people who hit rock bottom and say, okay, that's enough to keep me on the practice, keep me going. Now, if hearing about rock bottom gets you scared, okay, focus again on the, the advantages the good things that come from the practice. But the important point is you learn how to psych yourself so that you really stick with it. And learn that even when you start thinking about the unfortunate things, it doesn't scare you. It simply gives you more motivation to, to stick with it. And living in samsara requires some courage. If you let yourself get overwhelmed by the dangers, they'll eat you up, and you lose hope, and you lose energy. You have to realize we're living in a dangerous place. We've lived here for our, all along. It's just that sometimes we are alert to the dangers, and other times we cover them up. We get complacent. 
but we all face dangers of one kind or another. The only safe place is getting out. Your interconnectedness is not a lovely thing. It's not designed for the benefit of all. There is that belief that somehow we could fine-tune samsara, that we could all live together in a wonderful interconnected family. But interconnectedness is designed to have some people feeding on other people. And if one part of the system is going to be in good shape, other parts are going to be pretty bad. Look at the weather. We're having really fine weather here right now. Other places are having heat waves, cold spells, floods. Thailand is being flooded right now, which is an unusual time of year. Usually May and June you never have floods. And the whole system is ready to snuff us out at any, one, any point. So we live in a dangerous place, but you have to learn how to keep your cool and stay focused. Remember that story of the four mountains, the four mountains moving in, and the king, or your Buddha tells the king, suppose four mountains were moving in. One from the north, one from the west, one from the south, one from the east. What would you do? And the king says, well, what else can I do but calm the mind and practice the Dharma? The Buddha said, I warn you, king, aging, illness, and death are moving in. What are you going to do? Well, calm your mind and practice the Dharma. So it doesn't really matter who's riding the mountains, which political party or which political figure or which group of people. The mountains are moving in. So you've got to calm your mind and practice the Dharma. And if you find yourself here, you have trouble having motivation to practice the Dharma, figure out what motivation works. And if you have trouble calming your mind, you can figure out which ways you can calm your mind. The teachers are here to give you ideas. The books, the Dharma talks are here to give you ideas, but you have to figure out what works for you. After all, it is your happiness. It is your well-being at stake. So do your best to keep yourself on course.